there are lessons and then there are lessons and we are studying the, the lessons uh, you could not study anything more important to your personal well-being uh, than the fruit of the Holy Spirit I'm glad that we call them the supernatural fruit of the Spirit because they do not grow in carnality uh, they do not grow in the unconverted life the devil does create some synthetic things but when you wash the veneer off you see the reality down underneath a man can be ever so cultured and suddenly he gets angry and he's not cultured anymore but we're talking about something that grows from the inside out not from the outside in I was in a home one time uh, when uh, when I was out on the evangelistic field and uh, in the afternoon, the, the, uh, I was staying in a, in a home during the re re revival. And uh, in the afternoon, I noticed that the, that the lady of the house had a smudge of, uh, of uh, s grease on her face. She'd been in the kitchen working. And I, you know, I, I hated to say anything about it because after all, you know, I was just a visitor in the home. I wasn't supposed to find grease spots. And, and so... We went on to church that night, and she was sitting about the second row, and it was a little warm in the church and a little perspiration. And I looked at that lady, and I said, well, isn't that something? She had gone and powdered her face over the grease spot. And as she began to perspire, the grease spot really got plain. It just came right on out. And in my spirit, I said, now, isn't that just like the devil? All, all the devil wants to do is to powder you over, you know. He wants to whitewash you. But Jesus wants to wash you white, you know. He takes off the smudge. And, and that's the difference between the devil's bunch and God's people, is that they're trying to create fruit of the Spirit. There's no way to do it. You have to begin on the inside. The fruit of the Spirit comes from the Spirit, from the inside of us. And on the outside, people can see them. In this lesson, the fruit of the Spirit is called peace. Uh, peace is the third of these exciting attributes that are given to the Spirit-filled person and the Spirit-led life that they possess them. It is, an, it is an imparting of divine rest. That's what peace is. And of a divine happiness that you just flow from the inside with complete satisfaction. Peace is one of the greatest achievements. It's one that our world is constantly seeking and has been seeking for 6,000 years. And it's more remote now than it was 6,000 years ago. We build peace monuments like the United Nations, spend billions of dollars, and all they do is overlook wars. Just watch over the wars that are going. And even the men they send out to keep peace, they get shot you've been reading your papers. Uh, peace is one of the greatest achievements, and the world is seeking it and not finding it. The lack of peace is costing the nations of our modern world billions and billions of dollars in resources. When there is universal hunger on the face of this earth, and hunger is stalking the nations of the world in the way of famine, uh, that money could be spent to bring prosperity to the world rather than putting it down that, the gorge of that great monster called war because men do not have peace. Christ's greatest commission is being held back because, because of man's inhumanity to man. We cannot save the world because the world's busy fighting. And if you took war out of your news, you wouldn't have much left. That's right. Well, war and murder, murder is war on a limited basis, you see. Divorce is war on a limited basis, too. So if you took the struggle of man, the anger of man out of your newsprint, you wouldn't have a lot left. But I want you to know that God wants to give this world peace. But peace has to be a fruit and not an attachment. It can't attach peace to you. It has to come from the insides or you don't have peace. Millions of words are spoken about peace. Oh, the orators, they can take peace and do a great job, you know, talking about it. What, what God wants 
is Christ's kingdom of peace. Not just peace in a person, but his kingdom of peace. And that this essence shall flow from our spirits and our hearts to the total of mankind. In Galatians 5.22, we have a listing again of the fruit of the Spirit. It says, and the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. I would like to inform you that you cannot have peace without love. Are you here or not? All right. Some of you are trying to have it. You're trying to have peace without love. It doesn't work. Love covers a multitude of transgressions. All right. You cannot have joy without love. You just don't have joy unless you love. And you don't have peace until you have joy. You cannot have peace if you're not happy inside. You can't reflect peace, which is the offspring of happiness. So you must have joy in order to have peace, and you must have love in order to have joy. God wants us to have these. Jesus said in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, because they don't have any. Give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. If your heart's troubled, you don't have peace. Neither let it be afraid. If you have fear, you don't have peace. There has to be an absolute absence of fear before there's peace. And there has to be the absence of a troubled heart. You cannot have a miserable heart and have peace. Who possesses the fruit of the Spirit? Point number one on page 30 of your teaching syllabus. I certainly wish that all of you had one because we're, we've got a lot of lessons to go. And these lessons could change our lives. Do you believe that? Yes. Yeah. Only those who know Christ as Savior are justified and their faith, that their faith is in them, and they do have this divine peace. So the beginning of peace is to accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. We, 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 we don't want to be called dogmatic, and I presume we are anyway, but we don't want to be called dogmatic, but that the heathen do not have peace. The Bible says, why do the heathen rage? You know, they do not have peace. The beginning of peace is in the Prince of Peace. There's only one leader that can bring peace. His name is Jesus. There are not a dozen leaders and there are not a dozen ways to heaven. There's only one way to heaven. Christ said, I am the door. You have to take it or leave it, you know. And then eternity will be the justifier to see who was right and who was wrong. But I, I, I would just rather receive him on this side because the Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. But that's going to be too late on the other side. You'll confess, but you don't get saved by it you see. On this side, you confess and you do get saved by it. I'd rather do it on salvation ground. Can you say amen? All right. You can have divine peace, which will take away your worries, take away your sorrows, take away your confusions, take away your fears. That's what God's peace can do for us. How thankful we are as Christians, as born-again people, that even in the midst of our trials, now listen to that, in the midst of our sorrows and troubles, we can still have peace. Are you here? It don't matter what wave roars. There's peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let it roar. We have peace. The world can't give it. The world can't take it away. In Romans 5 and 1, it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we know of which we speak because we have witnessed it in our own spirits and in the spirits of multitudes of people. In Romans 14 and 17, peace is called a kingdom. <laughs> it's called a kingdom. In Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is peace, is righteousness, peace, and joy. These are the three ingredients that create the kingdom of God on this earth. Now, we are the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is within us. And within us, we have God's righteousness, divinely given, God's peace, divinely given, and God's joy, divinely given. Aren't you glad we have it? Peace that passeth understanding, I shall keep control of the Christian's minds. Say minds. We got so many 
people today that are confused in their minds. They should not be. Philippians 4 and 7 says the peace of God, that means it comes from God, fabricated by God, and is a gift from God to us. The peace of God which passeth all human intelligence, all human comprehension, all human definition, it passeth all human understanding, that that peace shall keep your hearts and minds through the Lord Jesus Christ. Science will never be able to understand why we have peaceful hearts, because science doesn't have the answer. The answer comes from God, the answer comes from heaven, and we have this peace because God gave it. We have it through the Lord Jesus Christ. How you can have real peace? Many people say, give me the answer, give me the answer. I've heard you long enough. The real answer is, first, number one, put your trust in God. Peace begins by putting trust. The peaceful little baby is in the arms of the mother because it trusts there. It don't scream and yell like it would if you grabbed it, you see, because it doesn't know you anyway, don't, don't trust you, and so it yells for mama. You put your trust in God. Uh, until you get your trust in God, you won't know what peace is all about. You cannot trust man. You cannot trust world conditions. You cannot trust human philosophies. If you can't anchor your peace in God, you're never going to know peace. The beginning of peace is an anchorage. Number two, depend on the Holy Spirit. Uh, if you're going to depend on human strength and human knowledge, human maneuverings, uh, you're never going to know peace. Th then you're going to be like a wave on a sea, up and down and up and down and up and down. But if you have true peace in God and you're depending upon the Holy Spirit, He's with you always, all the time, at home, in the workshop, in the office, on the streets. Wherever you are, He is there, and you can depend upon the Holy Spirit. If you know it, say amen. All right. Then he says, and then delight yourself in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Delight yourself. And, and Psalm 119, 165, it says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Great peace are those who are stuck in the Bible. It's a good place to get stuck. Great peace are those uh, who live in the Word. Every day they read the Word. Great peace those people have. And so the, the, the real peace is in the Word of God. If you will stop doing some other things that you're doing, whatever, and, and give the Word of God preeminence in your life, you're going to know peace. And this is an individual peace. You can have it in the midst of turmoil in a home. You can have it in, in a workshop that's full of controversy. You can just be peace. And, and you say, but they take it away from me. They don't take away this piece I'm talking about. This piece I'm talking about comes from God, and nobody can touch it. I'm really glad you got it. The peace of God, the Word of God says, is likened unto the flowing waters of a living stream. The peace of God is like flowing waters of a river coming out of the high mountains from the snow. That great preacher called Isaiah, one of the greatest preachers in the Bible, he said in Isaiah 48 and 18, these words, O thou that hast hearkened to my commandments, then had thy peace been as a river, and thy righteousness as a ways of the sea. Now he's speaking, O that thou hadst hearkened to my commandments. You see? How do you get your peace? Hearkening to the commandments of God. Reading that word, being in that word, then, then you have your, if you hearken to my commandments, then you would have had peace like a river. Like the tranquil flowings of a small stream, you would have had that kind of peace. If you hearken to the commandments of God, you cannot be in rebellion to God and have peace. There is no peace to people that are in rebellion against God. It's flowing with God, in God, for God, that we have our peace. And if you're expecting it from other sources, you will not find it. The peace of God is also like a quality of life. In, in Isaiah, same book, chapter 57, verse 2, He shall enter into thy peace. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. And so here you have a quality of life. Isaiah had found it. 
He found peace in his relaxation. He found peace in his rest. He shall enter into peace. Who shall? They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness, or walking in the laws of the Lord and walking in the truths of the Almighty. You say, well then, what causes unrest? What causes people not to have peace? Number one, do not, those don't have peace who do not have peace among themselves. Now, if you're going to be quarrelsome, you don't have peace. You can say you have peace, but anybody can look at you and tell you don't have any. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and 12, it says, We beseech you, brethren, that's talking to us, to know them which labor among you, that's your leaders and so forth, and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Some of us never read that yet and be at peace among yourselves. Are you here? You cannot just stay agitated toward the people you work with and the, your neighbors and so forth and your parts of your family and, and, and have peace. You can't do it. He says that we should be at peace among ourselves. The secret of having it flowing out of you is that it is a, around you also that you're at peace with others, not angry, not upset. All right? How is it that you don't have this true peace? When you have no regard for those over, over us in the Lord, a person that has no respect for the ministry, they also don't have any of God's peace in their hearts. Are you here? That's what God says. It is easy to be a rebel. It is easy not to be motivated by peace but by pride. And so we have to watch it very carefully. The lack of honor for our parents and our teachers there's no true peace to those who refuse to honor those whom God has placed over us. If you, if you do not want to honor those that should be honored, and I think that includes our police force, our laws, our, our teachers, our ministers, our parents, if you, if you do not want to respect them as you should, don't say, well, I got peace. No, you don't. You've got nothing but a roving and a raving and a snorting down inside in there that every time, you know, you got a chip on your shoulder and you got yelling at somebody because you don't have God's peace. Now, God wants us to have peace. Uh, he is the one that gives the peace. Peace is a fruit of the Holy Spirit flowing out of us, but the devil doesn't want us to have peace. The devil doesn't want us to have peace. He wants us to have anything except, except tranquility. God wants us to have peace. He, he is the giver of peace, but there are conditions. You can't be naughty and not naughty at the same time. You've got to be one or the other. And, and God wants us to have peace and not to have agitation within our hearts. All right, your number D on page 32 says, if we act disrespectfully to God, we cannot have peace. If we act disrespectfully toward his house, we do not have peace. If we act disrespectfully toward his word, we cannot have peace. Uh, there can be no true peace when God is not properly reverenced, respected, and loved. And so peace not only began with God, it ends with God too. And if we can't have the proper respect for all that is God's, then we cannot have the peace of God within our hearts. Now, now you say, but Brother Sumrall, you're making this kind of difficult for us. We're showing you that millions of people say, I want peace, and they won't pay the bill. Yeah. It, 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 it's, it's like saying, I want a good dinner at the restaurant, but you're not willing to pay for it. Well, either you pay for it or wash the dishes, one or the other. Between the two, I'd rather pay. So we must respect God and his word and his truth if we want peace. Who are those who do not have peace? It's your point E. Those who are easily offended. We live in a world where people are just wearing their feelings right out there on the end of the elbow. Am I saying the truth or not? There's more of offended people today than I've ever known in the history of the world. We, we, we just, I don't, it, it, it's an inward thing too. It's not an outward thing. It's an inward thing that we are determined that we're going to get offended to somebody. We just, you know, we got that made up in our minds and anywhere we go, somebody don't treat us right and we get offended. It's, it's awful to be easily offended. People don't know how to deal with you. They don't know when to say yes and no because you, you, you're, you're so easily offended. 
And then if you're easily offended, if you're easily to be irritated about something, that, that any little thing comes up and you'll just get fighting mad about it, that, 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 that is contrary to peace. And you cannot have peace with that kind of an irritated, agitated, angry spirit dwelling within you. It, it, does, not, it does not work with peace. Peace has tranquility. Can you say amen? And we should add there a forgiving spirit too. If you don't find it easy to forgive, you cannot have peace. Uh, if you've got grudges against somebody from yesterday and last week and last month and last year, then you cannot have peace. Uh, peace, peace and forgiveness go, go right together. All right. It says no person has peace when he is angry, when he's irritated, when he's offended, because peace demands tranquility. If peace cannot have tranquility, then it ceases to be peace. It, it is no longer peace. All right. Uh, in your number five, who are those who do not have peace? Those who seek uh, recognition from men. Uh, I feel sorry for people who feel like they have to please others. I, I watch them, I observe them, I see them in the ministry, and, and I, you, you know them in the workshops. There are people that, that they, all they do is seek to accept recognition from men. They'll just do anything, right or wrong or anything else, to get recognition from men. I'd just rather do a good job. And if it's recognized, it's okay, and if it's not, I'll do another good job. And if it's recognized, that's all right, but if it's not, I'm going to do another good job. Because I am not seeking to please man, but I'm seeking to please God. Now, that's the source of your peace. When you have pleased God, you do have peace, and if men don't like it, you still have peace. You've heard me say that other people's heads is the wrong place to keep my peace. Amen. Yeah, my peace is down in here. It's not in your head. Whatever you may say about me or think about me is irrelative when it comes to my peace. My peace comes from God. All right, your point number six Peace is the consequence of love. Let's look at that for a few moments, please. That without love, you, you know, and there is no peace existing for you. That love and peace are bound together and cannot be separated. So peace is the result of a communication with God in love. Peace is a, comes to us through a communication with God. That means it does not come, you know, just because you're a human or really just because you're a church member. Now, peace becomes through a communication with God. Number one, that you're born again. Number two, that you're walking in Him and obeying Him, reading His Word, praying to Him. And so this peace that we're talking about that belongs to you, should be yours, is a result of a good communication with God. It's also the deep manifestation of the Holy Spirit in our everyday life, and it brings and keeps peace. If you walk in the Spirit from early morning to late night, and you walk in the Spirit, you're going to have peace all day long. It doesn't matter what the rest of the world has, you're going to have peace. And, and you know, peace brings health to the body. <laughs> a peaceful person can't hardly get sick. He's got too much peace. But an irritated, agitated guy can catch everything comes along. Ooh. When we're in trouble, the presence of God is with us. There can be peace in spite of any kind of trouble that we may have. God can give us his peace. Number seven, uh, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. I, I have come to bring peace on the earth. And, first, and, and John's Gospel 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, let, uh, let neither let it be afraid. And so he is the Prince of Peace, he is the King of Peace, and he is the treasure of peace. You, when you get into Christ, you automatically get into peace. Peace, peace, and in in Philippians 4 and 7, we quoted it a few moments ago, that the peace of God passeth all understanding. And, and the great apostle says, let that peace keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Let that peace keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Strive that ye may be found by, by him in peace. That's in 2 Peter 3 and 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things. Be diligent that ye be found of him in peace. Now, now you ought to draw a circle around that uh, uh, because there, there's some of us that need to get into that. Beloved, seeing that you look for good things, blessed things, spiritual things, and the rapture too, be diligent that you be found of him in peace. He is not going to come back for stormy souls. He's going to come back for tranquil lives. Can you say amen? amen. All right. 
be found of him in peace and also without spot and blame. So peace is a benediction for any people, for all people. Peace is a blessing whenever it's exercised in our spiritual lives. It is a blessing. Peace is in Christ. It priest is Christ. He is the prince of peace. He is the creator of peace. Peace is a consequence of love in operation, of communion with God. And it is the best life, the better life that a person can live. Uh, true peace comes not from the absence of trouble. Uh, you ought to underline that, please, because uh, I think we might miss it. True peace does not come from the absence of trouble, but from the presence of God. The absence of trouble is not what brings you peace, because some can creep up pretty fast. It is the presence of God and that will keep that will be deep and pass all understanding in the exact measure in which we live and partake of his love within our hearts. So the two words, joy and peace, they, they furnish the color and the attractiveness and the beauty of the Christian life. When you have joy, everybody wants to see it. And they want to be around you. And when you have peace, they say, ah, doesn't it feel good just to be with that person because they have a peaceful spirit and a peaceful heart. And this is a fruit. <laughs> it is a fruit. Uh, it, it is a gift. You, you can't manufacture it. You can't purchase it. It comes from the inner, inner parts of us. And the inner parts reveal, are revealed on the outer parts. So God's peace is a gift from God for us. And God wants us to have peace.